<laughs> Thank you, guys. That was this is the deeper dive. Thank you for uh, that joke, Matthew. That was hilarious. Appreciate that. You're welcome. Better Simon. than my average. <laughs> I didn't hear Brooks. Could could you do it again just by yourself? Just kidding. <laughs> Hey, good to, good to be with you guys again. This is the Deeper Dive. I am here with, believe it or not, three pastors, uh, pastoring our three the three uh, branches of our church here at Bethel Church in Eastern Washington. How are you guys doing today? Doing great, man. Good. Good. Don't good leave yourself you out, man. That's right. You're I am right the, in there with the you guys. The there, so there are four, four of us. Pastors. Yeah. And Matthew apparently is now a regular fixture on the uh, Deeper Dive. Why is that? For better or worse. Matthew is our interim campus pastor across the river from where we are recording right now in Pasco, Washington. A whopping like eight minute drive, man. Yep. Yes. Eight minute drive, but kind of a different world yeah. over there, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. Brooks used to live in Pasco, but Brooks, you have moved, right? I graduated. <laughs> hey. <laughs> oh, sorry. Moving on up. <laughs> graduated, huh? Where are you living now, Brooks? Prosser. Prosser, Washington. Okay. It's awesome, yeah, man. Where you're pastoring. Yep. No, nah, man, there, that, that's a blessing to have you guys out there. All right. So. Probably nice on your gas bill, too. <laughs> yeah. Kind of starting this off here today, right? Question for you guys before you even look at the scripture, which which does come out of Acts 9. Um, favorite Old Testament prophet. Who's your favorite Old Testament prophet and why? Mm. Lay that on you guys. Give you guys a question right out of the blue. Favorite Old Testament prophet. So problem. off the cuff, so I reserve the right to change my answer later. Yes. I'm, I'm going to go with Joel. Hmm. Interesting. Last day's Joel. Let's there's, hear about it. Why? Locusts. Yeah, um, mostly because I like bugs. Yeah, no. So a couple key things that are in Joel. One is there's a clear call to lament, mm -hmm. and although repenting is a part of that, the focus is really on like just lamenting and being sad, which I think is not expressed often enough in church. Like it is sure. okay to be grieved and to cry out, mm -hmm. and like have that be just a thing that we do. And then, of course, it's also one of the great bridge builder to the New Testament, where you have all the prophecies that come into Pentecost, and that clear link there like shows so much about the authority of Scripture as you know, in prophecy and how that all that works, mm -hmm. and uh, brings those two kind of covenants together in a unique way. So I'm going to go with Joel. Awesome. How about you guys? I'm going to go with Elisha, S-H-A, nice. Second Kings. Um was raised reading the Bible, hearing Bible stories in Sunday school. But for some reason, he was kind of the hidden figure that I didn't really see until a couple of years ago when I preached through some, some of Second Kings. And I was like, wow, this guy's ministry is crazy. In mm -hmm. fact, oftentimes Elijah overshadows Elisha. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you put them next to each other, I think you could argue that Elisha's like short ministry is even more, I wouldn't say it's better, but it's like, it's astounding. Some of the things that... Mm -hmm happened through him and around his time. Some of them you scratch your head like interesting, but his his life looks, and so does Elijah, is so much like Jesus. Like it's the pattern that the gospels and even the life of Jesus looks like. So Love it. This may be kind of a weird uh, tie-in, but uh, since we've just gone through the book of Haggai, you know, the first temple gets all the press because mm -hmm. it was so fantastic. And yet in the book of Haggai, it's in the second, second temple, right? Mm -hmm. Is it will bring more glory to the Lord. Right. Yeah. So it's, sometimes that's I mean, what happens. Elisha right. asks for a double portion of Elijah's spirit, and Elijah's like, "Well, we'll see." Yeah. If you can see me leaving this chariot, it's all yours. Yeah. And he does. See. He does. Cool. Brother Brooks, favorite Old Testament prophet, Habakkuk. I think. Okay. Mm. Is it Habakkuk or Habakkuk? It's Habakkuk. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I would say Habakkuk too. Ha Hab Habakkuk, Hab Habakkuk. I, yeah, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> because he questioned God. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the, his, the dialogue between Habakkuk and God is interesting. And he, he had the courage to sit on um, a wall or a roof or something and, and look out and, and gave God a question and, and didn't just keep talking, but ask God a question and then he listened. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. I like that. That's cool. What I think I'll actually, well, yeah, I'll weigh in. I, I, I actually do, I would go with Elisha. Hmm. Or Eli, Elijah. I'm sorry. Elijah, number one prophet. Number one of those two. So I think part of it is because, man, he had these times of like incredible 
He had power. He was confident. Man, he was just just doing some awesome things. And then he would just quickly fall off the and become like depressed, Mm -hmm. right? And like, I'm the only one left. There's nobody else here. Uh, Alas, I think I can relate with that. Uh, There are times (laughs) I just feel like, man, I just feel like I'm, you know, I can do this. And other times like, I am the worst. Take me. Am I better than my father's? Just take me. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I actually have a reason for asking you guys that question. So we see some almost like uh, Old Testament prophet-ish stuff Mm -hmm. or following right in the in the in the in the, uh, uh, the uh, footsteps of Jesus, mm-hmm. in these next two healings in Acts chapter nine, uh, Matthew, who are the two people that are healed here in Acts chapter nine? So the first one is Aeneas, who is paralyzed uh, and bedridden, says for eight years. Although um, some people would say that actually it's supposed to be since he was eight years old. So, mm. but either way, really really powerful. And then we've got Tabitha. Um, which is the Aramaic name, and then that's translated into the Greek as Dorcas. Gazelle. And, I, you know, I do think, like, obviously Tabitha is portrayed as just, like, this really awesome disciple. But nonetheless, I don't want anybody coming to me later and being like, man, you're such a Dorcas. You're such a Dorcas. It just doesn't land the same way. <laughs> so good. That's so good. There you go. Okay. You should, yeah. Moving uh, right along. But I'm bomb. You think there's, there are probably people out there today named Dorcas, right? Yeah, I don't know if any of them listen to this podcast. Mm. Might, uh, yeah, I apologize. Or who will continue yeah. listening to this podcast? I was just wondering, after that. Like, you know, if anyone else has kids, you could name your child Dorcas. You could. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You could. Or Aeneas. Or, or, or Tabitha. Is or Tabitha. That, you know, Tabitha. Is that may be. Yeah, yeah. I've met go. some Tabithas. How about some Peters? Have you met some Peters? Mm-hmm. All right. Okay, so we, got, we have these two uh, wonderful, wonderful healings. Um, can we, uh, let, me, let me put you on the spot here, Adam. Um, what is going on at this point? In chapter nine of Acts, like where's the church at? Kind of, can you just kind of give us a bit of a context? Kind of a yeah. I wish we had like a map of Israel right here, so we could point it out. Maybe on like a felt board. But we're still in the phase of Acts where the gospel is moving from the epicenter of Jerusalem out to all the far reaches of that area, Mm -hmm. the outskirts of Judea to Samaria to Galilee, and then we're about to enter the phase where. Uh, it opens up to the Gentiles outside the land. And okay. that's so we're, we're almost see. there. Yeah, it's Saul's missionary journeys that will take place in the latter half of the book of Acts. So we're, as we turn to chapter 10, right? Actually, these this account with Peter, Peter will get a vision about all things being clean, which mm-hmm. will prepare him for this next phase of God's mission that moves out of outside of, it doesn't leave Jerusalem, it continues, but it, it now moves outside of those okay. borders. All right. So the these uh, people that Matthew just told about told us about they got healed here. These are these are still Jewish people. Yeah, in the church. Yeah, God is continuing to rescue His own people with the good news of Jesus, and here the healing of the healing of Jesus in their lives. Okay, so yeah. Jewish Christians mm-hmm. at this point. All right, um, you know, in these these healings of these two people, is there is there anything we can find out that we discover about really about what Jesus values in healing them? What, what are, is, there, is there something that that stands out here and what he, what he values? You're not, and go ahead, man. Well, yeah, I'll give you guys a chance, though. Got some thoughts? What do you think? You're, you're on a roll, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, okay, so sometimes what we can do is bifurcate or separate the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament as if they were different. And even if we don't say that with our like words, we might sometimes parse it in our minds that way. What I think you see here too is that God's heart for um, what you hear in the Old Testament, the the oppressed, the widow, the mm-hmm. orphan has not changed. And mm-hmm. Jesus' heart doesn't change from that. And even the apostles that follow after Jesus doesn't change. And so you, I think you see the heart of God here towards Aeneas and Dorcas um, with Aeneas desire to actually give him wholeness of life so he can actually move out of his bed and and not be paralyzed. And with Tabitha Dorcas, like her ministry to these widows has ended because she has died. And so by raising her from the dead, I think it's it's God's thumbs up in some way to that ministry. Like it it matters to him and she gets to continue that work. Mm-hmm. Although we were joking at lunch that Tabitha, if she, <laughs> like what happened to Tabitha's soul when she died and if she was in the new creation with Jesus and if she was mad at Peter for bringing, him, bringing her yeah. back, we're just joking. But like she comes back and all these widows, like their lives can be sustained again through Tabitha. So I think it, it shows something about the heart of God towards the broken and hurting and the oppressed mm-hmm. and the marginalized that mm-hmm. continues here even in Acts 
through this miracle. Do you think sometimes in the church, since we are we, we are grace oriented, right? And like I have heard people in Bible studies and stuff kind of really disparage, like for example, the Ten Commandments. Like, oh, we're away from that. Mm. You know, we're away from the law. We, we're not under the law. And good works works. Like you don't have to do good works to be saved. But there's like there's a I don't even know if I want to call it a balance, but there's a way of truth through these that we kind of see here. Do you agree with that? Have you guys seen that in Christian circles where we kind of sort of disparage the good works? Oh, we're we're not like we don't do that to you know uh, go to heaven. So we just kind of just chuck the whole thing out. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I certainly like. There's always that tension in any person's mind and any non-believers. Like, so the idea though that you know you can do whatever you want. That antinomianism. There is no law. Mm-hmm. Um, we were even talking this a little bit at my in my small group, which is going through Romans. And I was like, you know, to me, it's not even so much a thought that's always inside the church, but I think the antinomial thought is actually outside the church. Mm-hmm. There should be no law. You should do whatever you want. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, like actually, I think that. Even though people don't articulate it that way, I think that thought process is very common. It really doesn't matter what I do. Uh, as long as I, you know, just enjoy it or I'm happy or someone might put the no harm to others thing on there, but it's it's antinomianism. It's there should be no law. So the, high, the no highest rules. thing is I do what makes me feel good, what I want to do, what I wanna individual do. liberty. I want to be back at the center of my life. I want to be God in my life. It, and it, but because it's so prevalent in our culture, I think it does creep, it can creep in. Mm-hmm to the church that way too, because of that. And just like you're saying, you want to be grace oriented because truly you're not saved by those works. But of course the flip side is if we are saved, we should do good works. There's evidence of that. So we have a woman who is known for her good works right here, this Dorcas, uh, Tabitha lady. Have you guys known people like that? I mean, when you read this, is there somebody in your Mm -hmm. church that just comes to mind like, oh my gosh, you know what? That is totally, then Dorcas in my church is this person. Yeah, I know there there are so many families here at Bethel ha- that have given themselves to foster care. Um, more than I can name, more than I even know. There's one particular couple, um, and they go to the West Pasco campus. I won't say their name, but they they have given themselves to like a life of foster care with an open door to love and to care on these these kids who come from a number of different backgrounds. And for whatever reason, growing up, we weren't around a ton of families that did foster care, and it's only been in my adult life, even just in the last few years that I've, I've been a part of people's lives that are doing Mm -hmm. foster care. And it's, to me, it's so similar to what Tabitha does. And that's why on Sunday, we even, we connected, um, some orphan ministry, orphan Sunday to what, what Tabitha does here, because she, she is caring for these widows and these families that take in, um, foster children are giving their lives are providing shelter, providing love and care, providing food, providing everything that these kids need to experience love and, and, to flourish and even sometimes meet meet the Lord through it. So I have seen these people and I'm blown away every time I meet a family at Bethel that does foster care, mm-hmm. just the commitment that they do. And I'm sure it's hard, but they're always so positive positive with how they talk about it and how they treat the kids. Yeah. So yeah, like to me, that's that's who comes to mind. Well, here Dorcas is not even going, not even providing for younger people. It's more, it's more the widows, right? Yeah. yeah. So I mean, these are these are people. I mean, I assume it would have been pretty rough to be a widow back Absolutely. in those times. Like, what what would be the difference between maybe then and now? Hmm. Well, and we know it continues to be an issue in the church too. Right later on, Paul sets up a whole system mm-hmm. to take care of the widows, and I doubt they had that level of structure. But Tabitha seems to be kind of the forerunner of that. Yeah, where it's just not automatic that you can get a job, have protection, do the same things that you would be able to do. Have status. Have status. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. So you go back to, was it Acts chapter 6? Remember we, we, right, that, yeah, we all preached on that already. where one of the first big problems the church experienced was dealing with widows. How do we take care of these people we know we need yeah. to? I'm going to actually mention someone here that just came to mind. Um, Grace Kitchen in Pasco, a ministry mm-hmm. out of uh, East Pasco. They, they attend Bethel. They're... Uh, the Lorraine family, Devin and Amanda, like their heart is to see women who have fallen into addiction, homelessness, based on all kinds of circumstances in their life to help restore them back to life. Yeah, And it's not just by providing just care for them, but they give them life skills and work skills and build a resume so they can go get jobs. And the work they're doing is so much like what Dorcas is doing, like investing in these women so that and empowering them to live life and to flourish. Yeah. And that's just that's happening down the street. Yeah. So if I could go back, I don't know how many years ago, 
it was. Let's see if I can get this right. But I met with two other people, one from Bethel, one from uh, like some nonprofit or something. And the whole discussion was around our church's involvement in the community. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I mean, I just had to tell them, you know, oh my gosh, we're, we got a really big church. We, you know, we have certain, we have a pretty decent budget. And yet our involvement in the community, as far as with uh, those people who need help, who are, they need uh, the church's compassion, like we aren't really doing anything. Mm-hmm. That conversation actually led to us hiring uh uh, the uh, Angie, mm, <laughs> sorry, Angie. Like, oh. yeah, <laughs> but it actually led to us hiring Angie. Yeah, I mean, Angie has taken Bethel and just marshaled our resources mm-hmm. and our connections into this just, just these vital um, uh, contacts in the community, yeah. and even Brooks, even on out to the valley, right? I mean, you guys are pretty well dialed into you know some outreach, uh, compassion, compassion type outreach in the community, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. 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 Do you want to know what, like, yeah. Well, like, what are some of the things you guys do out there? Um, I think our, our, our main ministry is that, that we kind of prop up and champion, um, is not a strictly external ministry. It's, it's a ESL and citizenship mm-hmm. program <clears throat> and it's, it's internal as Cindy little runs it. Um, but it is external in the fact that everybody who goes through that ministry is outside the church. Uh, it's not a service for people inside the church. So it's, Uh it is an outreach purely. Um, and man, that thing is humming. Uh, Uh, it's weird that, uh, for as many migrant workers that we have in the Valley and how many first and second generation, um, immigrants we have that there's no program out there to help people get citizenship or, um, <clears throat> or uh, learn English. So, and this does both of those things. In the Tri-Cities, there's several programs like that, but not, not out in the Valley. So uh, we've, and it's just meeting, gosh, meeting a practical need yeah. for, 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 for folks. I met, I met someone that came to church yesterday uh, that is um, here uh, in, in the area and, and her husband must work. I, I didn't know what, what he does specifically, but um, must be here for, for, for work of some sort. We get a lot of people out there that are, are their husbands are, or spouses or whatever are here for work. Um, <clears throat> not just in the fields, but like in like academics and stuff mm-hmm. that they, they, but they're on a visa, they're on a student visa or something that doesn't allow them to work. doesn't allow them to, mm-hmm. to earn an income. So they're on a super fixed income and um, support and aid and all that stuff, and and we're we're providing a process for for them mm-hmm. to to gain citizenship. It's really cool. Um, cool, huge felt need, huge need to for, for even learning English. We've got some amazing stories of um, folks in our congregation that have come alongside others. Um, now we're talking first generation immigrants that have never learned English. And, you know, they're in their 50s or 60s and they're, quote, going back to school. Yeah, They've got their little, workbooks little that they're yeah. going through and all this stuff. And, and they're, they're loving it because they get to go to this ESL. Um, and for those of you, that, that's English as Second Language uh, course. Um, they get to learn English. And, yeah, just a felt need. And they get, they get to <clears throat> learn it in a community. Yeah. With people that care about them, love them. And then, you know, kind of Cindy's kind of a ninja, so she kind of weaves the gospel in there, right? Yeah. So not only are you learning English, but you're kind of learning English and some gospel lessons. But more than that, it's just it's it's this relationship that you have with mm-hmm. with churchgoers and and um, born again Christians that are able to well, if disciple I could, you. If I could just add to it too, Brooks, you got Cindy's husband, Mark. Yeah. who is just a legend out there. The mayor the of Valley. Prosser. Yes, the mayor yeah. of Prosser, mayor of the whole Valley. I mean, he just coaching so many sports for so many years, just a just a multiplicity of networks he's got, mm-hmm. not only within the uh, Caucasian community, if you want to call it that, but in the Hispanic community. Look mm-hmm. at him now, just weaving people together. Dude's got the biggest heart I've ever seen, man. And he's just, he's such a people person. Yeah. So, 100%. all right. So that- I want to I add one too. Yeah, that, go for I it. I want to miss this one, Mirror Ministries. Mm. Uh, Trisha McFarland, they've been, been members of Bethel for a long time, but- just in, even in our area, which sometimes we might think it's it doesn't struggle with this, but they help care for the victim, victims of sex trafficking. Mm-hmm. So that's a ministry that's many people at Bethel are involved in too. 
And it's kind of like Grace Kitchen, right? They're, they're actually moving into these places and helping women who have been trapped in, you know, for Grace Kitchen addictions, but here like trapped in and enslaved um, most of the time, probably not by their choosing. Yeah. If not always. Yeah. And helping restore them to life and, and giving them relationships and sharing the gospel and getting them back on their feet. So yeah. all of those, I mean, it's not exactly widows, but all these ministries we're talking about are are seeing people as the objects of God's love and they're seeing them and, and trying to step in and, and meet a need. I well, have and, a, a question. Yeah, go for it. Maybe this is like way off topic. And if it is, well, whatever. We'll just ignore it. Yeah, you just ignore it. <laughs> just keep going. Ask, ask whatever question you're going to. Do, do you think that there is a... Or I'll ask this way: How has the landscape changed? That now, one of the reasons, if we're reading Acts, one of the reasons that the need for the widows was so great is that there was no state care. And you look at it now, and <clears throat> there's no, almost no need for a church ministry to address widows like the early church, like the first, the first Christians, because we have state institutions that provide safety nets. How does it change? the biblical mandate to, uh, yeah, to, to, to help yeah, people. Care for does that make, does that make sense? Like mm-hmm. the, the, there's, there's, the state provides a large safety net and that's one of the things our tax dollars go to. Um, how does that change for the church, our mandate? Well, I'd, I'd say there, there's resources there, monetary resources and that sort of thing. But a big problem of, what happens when you, like you're incapacitated for some reason, you're a widow, widower, kind of get trapped in your home. It's for human contact mm. to be with other people, right? I mean, that that community intimacy with other people is just massive, right? And I think the church is like, we, we are well positioned to do that, man. We Look at what you were just talking about, Mark and Cindy. You know, we actually care. And we're, we're, mm. we're caring for people in the name of Christ, doing what Jesus did with these people, right? And I think, man, they step into that, situation where they feel the love, they'll add years to your life. They'll add life to your life, even right now. That, that's, I yeah, think it's I, one area where we can... I think so too. I don't think it changes our mandate at all. I mean, <clears throat> when the state does care for the needs, it's easy for us to say, well, those needs are being met. And so I'm not responsible for those things. But I'll just share one of the things that concerns me most when I hear Christians talk is when we start to look at people and we see the way that maybe the state is abused at times. And so we want to, we want to get rid of the care of the state and I'm not going to wait in there politically on what you should or shouldn't do. What concerns me though, is when Christians will say that, but not be willing to be part of the solution to actually care for people. So it's like the state has stepped in and they might do a great job. They might do a terrible job or somewhere in between, depending on where you live. Right. Like, I don't know. Um, but how cool to be if this church stepped up our game, not just Bethel, right? But like the capital C church just in our region and in our country. And we started meeting needs and we started talking and even showing a heart to care for needs where there wasn't a need for the state. But what I worry about is if like the state goes away, can the church rise to the occasion? Like can our hearts look at people who need care either because they're in a place where they have something been taken for them or they have chosen a lifestyle like, can we look at those people and step in and be like, we want to help you? And if the church isn't willing to step up, like that's a that's a pretty bleak picture where like, the, both the church doesn't want to do it and the state doesn't want to do it. And so it worries me at times, like, can the church, can we be who we need to be for the world? And I hope that yeah. the, the answer for the future is yes, but it's going to take a, like a, a, an effort of all of us to grow a heart for all of these people we see yeah. God having a heart for. What do you I, I would... I'll, I'll I'll go I'll go one step further. I mean, you kind of poke the bear. I'll like I'll like go <laughs> you and poked it first. I'll go and punch it. That <laughs> um, and my coffee's like kicking in, so I'm kind of. So he wants to go punch it. Brooks just woke up. Strong coffee. Yeah. Um, I would say also I think there is a I I worry. You say what you worry about, mm-hmm. Adam. I worry that because the state does have resources, the state has a safety net that is that is built in place. And honestly, like, unless society just completely implodes, it's never going away, right? I mean, one, how many times has a government program been erased? Like, right, it doesn't happen. Um, and are we as believers willing to enter into the system that is presented to us and get behind the use of our tax dollars, which is that's that that is what is in the system, get behind the use of our tax dollars to help those in need? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that. Uh, I mean, so 
we might not have a huge influx of widows right now. That might not be a big problem, but single mothers might be. Oh man! And uh, we we need to address how how the church can help single mothers. But are we also willing to play by the rules of the game that are presented to us and say, okay, uh, would you be comfortable using your tax dollars to help single mothers? Um, especially if it means if there's going to be more single mothers because uh, we have the the laws around Roe v. Wade have changed. Now there might be more single mothers. Are we willing to say, yeah, we 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 so want to help people that we're willing to yeah, change maybe some of our our own views and policies and how tax dollars are used to. to Help well, I think you're saying co- cooperate with the state. Yeah, right. Work, work, work hand in hand with the state. And and you know, I, I, be good citizens. Yeah. yeah, wouldn't it be like if if like the the evangelical heart for the unborn, which is so biblical, was matched by like an equal heart and desire to see like young mothers or even pre young mothers cared for in a way where they don't end in a place where they're wanting to think about aborting a child or even mm-hmm. uh, once they have the child, the church is like, man, we're going to take care of you. Like what, mm-hmm. what do, I'm sure I know that there are pockets and there are people at Bethel. I think that I think it's something like you medical too. There are pl- people that are trying to do this, but if all of us burn with that, that heart for both the unborn that God loves with his whole heart and also those who are alive and might be caring for young children they can't care for. And we were like, we want to take care of, of both. Like, what would that look like? Mm-hmm. Matthew, you haven't said anything. We've been cutting you off. What are you thinking? Uh, I mean, there's you, you were wading into some complicated territories of like the state and stuff. Mm-hmm. I think it was, I'm pretty sure it was Francis Schaeffer was making that observation. Um, someone can Google it and correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was his work where he was looking at how the state was taking over more with the money. And he actually predicted it's actually going to cut off the church's ability to do that and to be generous ourselves mm-hmm. as the income was, we can't just give with our heart. Um, so there's two, I'm just saying there's two sides of the coin. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Uh, so, I'll, I'll let people sit in, in that tension. And then the, the other side, of course, is it's not just widows, right? Like, yeah, orphans and widows, like we know those two off the top of our head, but all over scripture, care yeah. for the immigrant and Proverbs that speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. It's anyone who has a need, yep. right? Who, who is my neighbor? It's the one who has mm-hmm. the need. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, so that heart never changes, right? So it doesn't, if our neighbors are widows, they got a need, mm-hmm. let's do it. If our mm-hmm. neighbors are single moms, let's do it. If our neighbors are... Um, Im- immigrants who need ESL, let's do it, right? Mm-hmm. Like that, that's yeah. the heart that should be within the church. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not advocating for any sort of specific government program. I hope people hear that. I'm just saying that we, there is a tension. I like you put it, Matthew, there's a tension that we need to live in yeah. and the mandate doesn't change. That's what I think. So what you're saying is when you first started talking, I'm like, are you telling people not to pay taxes and to give those to other people? Or is what you're <laughs> saying like, Think about where your tax dollars are going and try to be a part of the solution by like like voting in a way that like it's like, man, it may not be perfect, but at least I know my tax dollars will go to care for these needs. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's what I'm Let's at least. be more aware. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm asking people to – because I think what we can do is uh, completely shut out – so with, with Roe v. Wade, let's say, right, the church rightfully rejoiced at the, the overturning of Roe v. Wade yeah. on a – federal level, um, turning it back to the states for the decisions of the states. The church rightly rejoiced, and I think the church was right to rejoice. That's my my stance. Uh, at any time we can make any sort of movement of saving the Imago Dei, it's good. <clears throat> um, the The reality is, is that there, there are still going to be struggling moms. Right. And uh, either, are, are, we, are we going to address that either through our own giving mm-hmm. and church initiatives, or would you be okay with aligning some of your policies. Yeah. So getting down brass tacks, how you vote, would you be okay saying, man, I, I, I want to see moms taken care of single moms taken care of so much that, um, I'm going to use the resources at my disposal or, or back the people that back the politicians that would use their resources to, uh, provide for single moms or provide for women who would be, that they wouldn't be in that position. In well, yeah, so that's, an, that's another podcast we can record sometimes, but there are people <laughs> out there, like Paul Vischer, for, for instance, I think he's the VeggieTales guy, right, has a podcast that he came out a couple years ago, and he and some guys are talking about, and there's a gal in there too, like how to actually get rid as much as you can of the problem of abortion, and that there's things bigger than just legislation, mm-hmm. like loving young moms and caring for those people that can prevent them from getting into the situation in the first place. Like yeah, that, that should saying. be our goal, man. Right. How. Yeah. 
I just think of Jesus. We're getting way off topic, but <laughs> sorry, sorry, Dawson. We're like, stick to the <laughs> script. Uh, I just think, gosh, how, how, what would Jesus do in this situation? In the WWJD, okay, yeah, super cliche, whatever. But think of Jesus meeting the woman at the well. Mm-hmm. There was, he, he had a third way of interacting with her that was different than anybody else in the, in the society at that point. I feel like that's what we need to be after. You know, a number of Christians, like I just think right here in, in our area, Brooks, that they have done that. In other words, they have they have stepped, they've seen a need and they've stepped into developing nonprofits. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and going back to Angie, she is one of the thing, great things she's done is network with so many different mm-hmm. nonprofits in the sure. area, almost all of which are are led by Christian people, mm-hmm. right? Because they they've seen a need, they saw where the state wasn't meeting their need, yeah. and they're like, okay, cool. They start this nonprofit, and then they they start doing just awesome things, and that mm-hmm. shows you the power of what we can do when we've got our eyes open, we yep. see needs, and we just like step into it. And Lord, quite often we'll raise up a well. We started this thing off talking about uh, prophets, right? Yeah. The Lord raised up prophets to meet needs, to to have His word spoken to a certain area. And I think even with some of these nonprofits and people who are reaching out to people that nobody else is reaching out to, man, that is the spirit of God leading people, totally. right? Raising up champions and telling them to go after that. Yeah. So while we live in the current state, like engaging those, we listed a bunch of those. Yeah. <clears throat> Not to mention that God gave us two eyes to see and mm-hmm. ears to hear what's going on around us and being being willing to enter into some of those situations to help yeah. do exactly what you're saying. Right. Well, hey, I just rejoice. I do rejoice in a number of things that our church is involved in. Um, I know there's a lot more to do, but I think, I mean, you guys have like just listening to this conversation today. have just really like encouraged me and challenged me to keep my eyes open. There are people out there that are hidden that mm. we need to see. That's and maybe word. we're the ones that the Lord wants to raise up and marshal our resources and, sure. and use us to be like a Dorcas and reach out. Well, guys, thank you very much, man. I just appreciate you guys. Appreciate you guys' heart. You guys aren't just teachers. You guys, you guys care about people. Really appreciate it. Well, this has been the deeper dive coming at you. Uh, you can get onto Bethel.ch onto our website, and you can check out our church if you would like. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.